Making a player feel lost is one of the most frustrating things a game can do. Progress is held just out of reach and your forward momentum blocked, not because of a lack of skill or understanding, but a miscommunication between you and the game. Now, sometimes it's the fault of the game and sometimes it's on us, but that doesn't change the fact that simply not knowing what you're supposed to be doing isn't the position that any player should want to be in. The problem is that if you signpost and guide players too much, then you hamstring the interactive core of the gaming medium and suck the fun out of adventure, challenge and good old fashioned mastery. So how do games get around being too handholdy whilst also giving you enough direction? Well, I'm sorry to say that there's no special subconscious trick that would make for a great thumbnail, it's simply a matter of communicating in a more effective way for the medium. When playing games, it's not all that often we're actually looking out for written or spoken language, and when we are, it's usually pretty obvious. But what we are constantly paying attention to is the language of level design. How stuff is laid out, how stuff looks, how it all sounds, all that good, uh, stuff. But before we get into that, let me give you a quick semiotics crash course, just so we're on the same page. A unit of language is made up of two parts, the sign and the signified. The sign is the physical thing, in the case of written words it would be a bunch of scribbles on some paper. The signified is our informed interpretation of what would otherwise be a meaningless image. These are just some random pixels on a screen to someone who's never seen Latin based characters or can't read English, but to you, probably, it means the architect of games. Game design works in exactly the same way. This floppy disk in Cave Story is coming up on 30 years out of date, but it's just the sign. The thing it signifies is save point, a connotation that carries on to this day. Even if there's no words involved, games can communicate just as effectively with their audience as any book. Signs and signifieds are literally everywhere. Everything we see communicates something to us, even if we don't realise it. And game devs can leverage that by showing us something simple and subtle to communicate something much more complex. There's a bunch of different ways they can do this, but for ease let's split them up into structure, sound and symbology. Let's start off with structure, which is quite simply put, how the level is laid out in order to subtly direct not just the player's movement, but also their eyes. This stuff can be seen all over the place, from artistic composition to cinematography to even architecture. Not that I know anything about that. Controlling where a player looks using the structure of an environment allows you to more easily impart information to them because you know exactly where they'll be looking, and it also lets you leverage some quirks of human behaviour to get them where you want them to go. These techniques are most useful in exploration focused games like Metroidvanias, so let's take a look at how Metroid Prime guides you around its second major area, the Chozo Ruins. Entering the main courtyard, two classic techniques get employed in quick succession. Firstly, these beetles popping out of the ground snap our attention away from this door here, because we can't go through it yet. Next, we're drawn forward by this lovely arch. Now, humans, you guys love doorways, portals, arches, anything like that. The negative space draws your eyes through it, encouraging your body to follow. The stairs right afterwards give us a great view of some horizontal lines, which draw our eyes over to this energy tank, and then up the implied pathway these rocks and roots create. Now, if you've played the game before, you might be thinking, hang on, this is the wrong way, and you'd be right. This detour is very intentional bringing you quickly to a dead end we can't squeeze through to tell players there's some stuff they can't get to quite yet and they'll have to come back later. But why not teach players this lesson with the door down here? Well there you run into the risk of players turning around and leaving the way they came, but when exiting this upper door, we see contained in yet another portal frame and again drawn to by this line of motion, the correct path forwards. After a corridor we're led upwards towards an obvious door, but oh no, a new enemy the fast moving war wasps which give us a glimpse of this room we might have otherwise missed, the save room, quite handy as we're about to fight a boss and get the missiles. Back to the courtyard and some new beetles have appeared to guide us back through the archway and to the door we were guided away from before. This is where we get the morph ball and a look at a strange purple door we might want to remember for much later in the game. Then it's back out and time to follow the natural path up to the top level, through here and onto the second part of the Chozo ruins. By controlling the space around the player, Metroid Prime directs us without spoiling the lonely mysterious atmosphere the series is so known for. The trick is to leverage existing human impulses and stuff we're going to be looking at anyway, rather than breaking the spell by intruding upon that experience. Enemy motion in particular is used all over the place in Metroid Prime to show you where you're supposed to look. 
The best example of this is in Talon Overworld, where we see these fleeing pirates start off surrounding this crate of deadly Phazon you might want to scan, but fly away towards the crashed frigate, prompting you to try and give chase. And they even make a reappearance when you finally do get there, which is a nice touch. Another great thing Metroid Prime does is sound, but let's give that one a break from my inevitable video on the Prime games and look at something else. How about the unfairly maligned Bioshock 2? This whole game, but specifically the opening level, is a masterstroke in auditory communication, even ignoring the characters who actually talk. The first and most obvious form of this is simply the environment of Rapture itself. A constant presence is the sound of gushing water and the creaking of scaffolding as the whole place falls apart. Rapture isn't just dying anymore, it's dead and decaying, as nature takes it back. A fact that's difficult to forget as this sound rarely if ever leaves completely. The presence of water also highlights something else, the way our character, Subject Alpha, moves. He's big, slow and heavy, causing massive crashes and splashes as he stomps through each level. This combined with the weighty sounds of his primary melee attack, the drill, tells us that in comparison to Jack and his weedy swipes from the first game, we're playing as a creature of incredible power, and true to form, Bioshock 2 is a much more aggressively focused game. It's not all power fantasy though. There's been a lot more care and attention put into Alpha's sounds of exertion and pain, particularly when you get your first plasmid. Listen to that, that's not the sound of the terrifying big daddies we used to know. This is a wounded, almost pitiable creature something falling apart just as much as Rapture is. Contrast that with the high-pitched, aggressive screeches of your main adversary, the big sister, and the tense violins that back her up. She's quick, angry, and intelligent, a bigger threat than even you and in every way your polar opposite, highlighted by those very same violins transitioning into this somber theme once you're alone again after facing the big sister for the first time. That's not to mention the more gameplay-oriented stuff, like how the sparking of electricity alerting you to stuff you can interact with using your fancy new plasmid, carries over much larger distances than it really should, and cuts right through the other ambient effects, or how the constant presence of again the slow, laboured breathing of Subject Alpha in the underwater sections assures players that there's no need to go frantically looking for oxygen. Bioshock 2's opening says surprisingly little, and yet communicates so much, not only telling us all about how our main character feels and moves, but it also makes us immediately empathise with what used to be the biggest, strongest monster in Rapture. The final method of non-verbal communication I want to look at is symbology, which despite the name is actually super straightforward. Symbology is all about communicating using stuff players already know. For example, what do you think these things do? Uh, duh, they're red barrels, of course they explode. This is a trope that goes all the way back to the oldest games and even to action movies and it's so widespread that games don't even have to bother telling you how it works, instead letting them become a shorthand for serious explosive damage. But what if you want to ward away players from danger rather than create it? Well, you need to look no further than our childhood. Some of the earliest things we're taught to fear are hot things and sharp things, and these lessons become deeply ingrained in our psyche. This is why fire, and particularly spikes, are such amazingly effective ways of dissuading a player from doing something. Don't stand in the fire, don't jump on the spiny, you get the picture. By using the language of sign-signifier relationships we already understand, games don't have to go through the trouble of explaining them. Games can also create new connections between ideas to communicate more complex stuff more quickly. In any of the endless 4X games, but specifically Endless Legend, synergistic mechanics are united by colour. The science icon is blue, blue-hued arctic regions produce more science, all the science buildings are blue, and the primary colour for the palette of the sciencey factions is, you guessed it, blue. The same applies for red industry, green food and yellow dust, and a little bit for purple influence. These subconscious associations let the game efficiently communicate to the player and minimise the downtime they spend reading menus. You don't need to read what this terrain produces or what this building does because on a subconscious level you already know they both make food and can react accordingly. Endless Legend also uses a bunch of symbols for a bunch of game mechanics like attack power and resource counts to further condense comprehension time and keep you making interesting decisions for as much of your game time as possible. Of course, there's nothing wrong with going for something less sophisticated and leaving breadcrumb trails of collectibles, because you know people will do everything in their power to hoover that stuff right up and not even really know why. 
Spoilers, it's because we're inherently greedy. Oh, speaking of a hat in time, a really great way to show the usefulness of effective non-verbal communication and the issues caused by doing it badly is to look at a hat in time. Which, if you don't know, is an indie collectathon platformer which had quite a long development time, and this means that you can really see the team's level design chomps evolve over time. The first level, Mafia Town, has been in the game in some form since its debut back in 2013 and is… kind of a mess. The level is incredibly busy with a bunch of dead ends, random side bits that draw your attention away from the level objective, and a general lack of visual cohesion. Several times in this world I found myself circling the whole island trying to find out where I was and where I was supposed to be. There's even a great central orientation point in the form of this giant geezer housing the Mafia base, but a combination of the game's camera angle and its heavy depth of field prevent you ever really seeing it, keeping your perspective locked onto the technicolour maze of streets and scaffolding. A Hat in Time is an exploration focused game, so it needs spaces to explore, but like Metroid before it, that needn't come at the cost of players getting lost. Well placed non-verbal communication can preserve that feeling without confusing your audience. Unfortunately, these problems extend to the enemy design. After hitting these Mafia goons a few times, they catch on fire, so what does that tell us as a player? Probably to stay the hell away, or maybe hit them with an ice attack. Nope, it means they're blocking your basic melee move and they're only vulnerable from above, either to a dive or a standard jump. This is for reasons that, to this day, are not completely clear to me. It's not helped by the fact that there are non-aggressive Mafia guys also hanging around the level that aren't a threat and you can't kill that look exactly the same. These two design quirks seem small but end up being pretty large conceptual speed bumps in the way of a seamless experience. By subverting a player's expectations of how enemies work and telegraph their attacks, all a hat in time succeeds in doing is confusing players who were subconsciously expecting something else. This lack of clear subtextual communication and direction is frustrating because it means that the game has to resort to more obvious means of telling you where to go like these obtrusive markers or discovery destroying spoken instructions. This is all true, at least for the first world. As the game goes on, its communicative design improves dramatically. The final and most recently developed level of the main four, Alpine Skyline, is fantastic at this. Each little area starts off with a broad overview, shows you a clearly identifiable end goal at the top of each island, and uses all of those great level design tricks like implied pathways and framing to guide you through the stage while still letting you experiment and explore for yourself. It's amazing to see how far the Gears for Breakfast team came in the five or so years of development. My favourite bit of communication though, comes in one iconic moment in the level Queen Vanessa's Manor. I don't even have to tell you anything about this level to show you how effectively it can inspire a very deliberate, very specific reaction. Holy shit! This is supposed to be a kiddie game! That yawning, discordant sound design, the unnatural swapping colour palette to highlight the red eye, the change in focus and the litany of in-level frames helping to make Queen Vanessa look even bigger than she actually is, are used to phenomenal effect here. All with the aim of telling you, you can't kill this thing, get the fuck out. All in all, the number one idea you need to have in mind in order to use level design to talk to players, is to let the game itself do the talking and build the directions to navigate your world into the world. Donut County, a fab little puzzle game, uses different coloured terrain to highlight things you need to suck up with your magic reverse Katamari hole. It uses cultural ideas of rabbits liking carrots and frogs liking flies to ease you into some cool puzzles, and the sound of seagulls, as well as this big firework, to point you to some birds you need to hit with a little firework. It's tiny stuff really, but it goes a long way to smoothing out the play experience in a way that explaining this stuff through dialogue never could. And of course, it's important to always communicate in multiple ways, because there's no way of knowing which signs the players will interpret or understand in the same manner as you. In the case of Metroid Prime, not only does the level design itself give you glimpses of optional upgrades like energy tanks and missile upgrades, they're designed to contrast with as many background palettes as possible, and they make a subtle buzzing noise to tell you they're around. See, I told you I could have used it for the whole video. And of course, people might have disabilities that say prevent them from hearing all of your fancy sound based clues, so sprinkle some visual ones in there too. 
all art is communication and interpretation, and if we only stick to the obvious stuff, then video games will be unable to portray more complex ideas. Plus, talking to players via the medium of level design and innate human responses to stimuli are ways of transcending barriers of language and culture, creating experiences that anyone can appreciate and everyone can enjoy. But we're only going to get there if both developers and players can have a conversation about the importance of the little things in game design, even if neither have to say a word. Wait, did, did I just imply people should stop watching game design videos on YouTube and start experiencing this stuff for themselves? Shit. Oh, it's you? You're still here? Well, soon as you are. I was about to tell you about this cool new thing all the kids are doing called Like, Comment, Subscribe, Bell. Apparently, it carries with it an almost narcotic eye, and best of all, it's free. So, really, you've got no excuse. You want to be cool, right? If you want to be straight edge and don't want to jump through YouTube's terrible hoops, then, well, might I suggest tipping me a few bucks on Patreon. You get cool stuff like early videos, reviews, recommendations, and you can even get in the illustrious list of my mysterious benefactors who are Samuel Vanderplatz, Vodjan Palagora, Alex Deloch, Dirk Jan Karambeld, Ray's Dad, Joseph Robson, Joshua Binswanger, Lunar Eagle 1996, Daniel Metges, Strateger in Ultima, Patrick Romberg, Baxter Heel, Fido, Brian Notariani, Asaran, Jonathan Kirkinson, Alexis Chenyaz, and Chow. Thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon, without you this video wouldn't exist, and I will see you in the next one.